be in Habakkuk. <laughs> Habakkuk was a minor prophet. Now, I've always wondered about that term, minor prophet. Because I just think, you know, you've got minor prophets and you've got major prophets. I've always just thought if you was a prophet, it's kind of a major deal. So I've always wondered how, who come up, we're going to separate and make this a little less than the other, make him a minor prophet. Somebody I reckon smarter than I was. <clears throat> We'll be in Habakkuk chapter 1. Before we get started, I'm going to do a spiritual breathing this morning. Any of that junk you brought in, anything that's bothering you this morning, anything that's keeping God from ministering to you this morning, as you breathe in, you ask God, or if you breathe out, you ask God to take that away from you. Just take whatever it is away from you. If you breathe back in, you ask God to, to fill that void, that place, with His perfect Holy Spirit. Allow Him to minister here this morning. Habakkuk chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse perverse judgment proceeds. The Lord replies, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. For I will work and, and, and work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are also swifter than leopards and more fierce than even in wolves. <clears throat> their, charges, their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagles that hasten to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings, and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap upon earthen mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes, and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing his power to his God. Father, I thank you for this opportunity this morning, Lord, to preach. Father, I pray at this time that you, that I can decrease, you'll increase, Lord. And Father, you'll hide me behind your cross. Father, I just pray that your spirit go out before me, preparing the hearts, preparing the minds for each and every person here, Lord. Father, I pray that you bind Satan and loose your spirit on this group of people whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so. Let me tell you, I was watching the president. How many of y'all watched the presidential debate last week? I, I was watching that thing and I thought, man, what a bunch of clowns. Uh, here you are, you got two people that all they did was, was fuss at each other and accuse this and of that and that and that. And I told Cheryl, I said, this would have been like Putin. And I'm not getting political up here. Y'all don't get me wrong. I, I'm making a point here. But this would have been like putting Ethan and Sarah up there and saying, y'all debate on this. Y'all go ahead and y'all have a debate. Because I know and she knows what's going to happen before long is Ethan's going to be saying, well, Sarah did this. And Sarah's going to be saying, Ethan did this. And you know what I wanted to do when I was watching that debate? I wanted to send the two of them to the room. That was just my natural instinct as a father of two children that act like them two were acting, to send them to the room. And I couldn't help but ask, what in the world is going on? What in the world is going on in this world? We've narrowed it down to this. I, now, I know the two parties, I know Nathan, I know there's other parties out there, but most of the world looking at it saying these are the two choices we have. And that's what most of the world saying. I'm thinking these are the two choices we have. This is what we've narrowed it down to. What is going on here, Lord? What, what, what in the world is going on? I mean, this is what we've narrowed our choices down to is these two people here. And then the question comes, as I was asking them, am I even supposed to question God? Because I grew up, when I grew up, I was told, you just don't question God. You don't question God about things. You, you, just, you just don't do that. I remember when my mama first got sick with cancer. She said, uh, she said, I know I'm not supposed to question God, but I can't help but wonder why I got this cancer. And I thought, well, you know, when I look at the Bible and I look back through it, 
All I see is people questioning God. I see people asking God for answers. I see it all through the Old Testament. I see it through the New Testament. Where did we get this learning from? Where did we come up with this idea that we couldn't come to God with our questions? And then I look at Habakkuk, and that's exactly what he does. He comes to God with some questions. Look at what he says in verse 1 through 4. He, he actually, that's exactly what he does. He comes to God with these questions. He says, he's crying out to God, what about, God, what about all this sin that's going on around me? What, all this debauchery, all this stuff that's going on. He's crying out. <clears throat> he's asking, why, why do mean people get away with being so mean? Do we not ask the same questions today? Yes. Yeah. You know, we look around and we say, God, why do mean people get away with being so mean? What's up with all this stuff going around? We have made things that used to be sacred. We've turned them into things that are just common. You know, we're killing babies by the groves. <coughs> Unborn babies are just being killed by the groves. We had everything, what used to be abnormal is now normal. Everything's getting flipped upside down, turned around. Sin has become the norm. And you can't help but ask God, what is going on here? What is going on with this place? You know, Habakkuk's time, it weren't a lot different than ours. They had the same things going on. They had things, <clears throat> all kinds of debauchery going on. They had all kinds of things. If there's one key point I want you to take away today, y'all listen, because I want you to hear this. God may seem silent and uninvolved in our world, but he always has a plan to do away with the evil and always works out justice. The key is, it's in his time. In his time. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for those who love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. Not some things, not just the good things, not just the bad things. He said all things work together for those, for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God has a plan. God has a plan. That's what He's about to tell Habakkuk here shortly. <clears throat> God has a plan. When we go to God and we have these questions, we, know, we can be assured that God does have a plan. We just need to recognize there are times when we don't understand how God is moving. I mean, I, I, you're a fool if you say, I, I know how God's working all the time. Because you don't. There's just times we do not understand how God is moving. We don't understand why bad things happen to good people. <coughs> We don't understand why small children die. Parents have to bury their, their children. We don't understand a lot of these things. There, there's just a lot of things we don't understand. But we do need to realize God has a plan. Even through all that, God has a plan. But you say, preacher, my faith has been threatened. What do I do? Or you say, preacher, God's inaction just seems a little bit too unbelievable to me. Well, I'm glad y'all asked some questions because there's a few things you can do. There is a few things you can do. When you feel like it, and every one of us has felt like that at some time or another, every one of us has felt like our faith is threatened and we're wondering what we need to do. So what do we do? What do we do when that first thing you do is you stop and you pray? Stop and pray. That's the first thing you can do. Don't do anything out of emotion. Don't ever do anything out of emotion. You ever done an impulse buy that you regretted later on? Cheryl and I have this thing. We do not buy vehicles or anything like that when I get rained out of work. Because we've done that about three different times and we regretted every purchase. It was one of them impulse things. I'm rained out today. We're going to go look at cars. End up buying something we regretted later on. It's been years ago that we did this. So we don't buy cars on rainy days anymore. But you buy, do things out of emotion. You do things out of impulse. And you end up regretting it a lot of times. Don't let panic grip you. Don't let panic grip you. When panic does try to get you, when panic tries to get them claws in you, pray. Pray. Start praying. You know what panic is? Here's the definition of panic right here. Sudden, uncontrollable fear or anxiety, often causing wildly unthinking behavior. For the Christian, this indicates that we've took our focus off Jesus. That's exactly what it is. When we start to panic, it's because we've took our focus off Jesus 
and put it into other things. And panic mode kicks in. So we need to stop. We need to pray. We need to look to Him for the answers. Stop and pray. That's the first step. There's a woman at work when she received a phone call that her daughter was very sick with a fever. She left work and stopped by the pharmacy to get some medication for her daughter. She returned to her car to find that she had locked the keys inside the car when she went into the pharmacy and was now unable to get into her car to drive home. She didn't know what to do and started to panic, so she called home and told the babysitter what happened and that she did not know what to do. The babysitter told her to find a coat hanger and see if that would open the door. The woman looked around and found an old rusty coat hanger that had been thrown down on the ground, possibly by someone else who had locked her keys in the car. Then she looked at the hanger and said, I don't know how to use this. So she bowed her head and asked God to send her some help. In doing so, she obeyed, she obeyed the command to never stop praying. Do you think God would reward her for that? Within five minutes, a motorcycle roared up and pulled into the parking space next to her car. A rough, dirty-looking biker got off and saw her situation. He asked if he could help her. The woman thought, this is what you sent to help me, God? Then finally, she finally told him yes, as she needed, as she needed to hurry and get home to her <laughs> sick daughter. He walked over to the car. In less than one minute, the car was open. She hugged the man, and through her tears, she said, thank you so much. You're such a nice man. The man replied, no, I'm not, lady. I just got out of prison for car theft. The woman hugged him. The woman hugged the man again with sobbing tears, cried out to God, you even sent me a professional. <laughs> don't, don't ever panic. Don't panic. Seek God. Turn to God and pray when that panic starts to take hold. Second thing, get back to the basic things you know about God. There's some basic things. Titus 1-2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time begins. We know that God cannot lie. That's one of the basic things we know about God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you will be able to bear. So God won't put more temptation on you than you can bear. He'll give you a way of escape from that temptation. We know that about God. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So God is not the author of confusion. We know that about God. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 13, Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we know that God will never leave us or forsake us. So the third thing we do is we take what we know and we bring it to bear on the problem. We apply it to the problem. We believe these <laughs> things, we apply them to the situation. So when there's a cute, when, when when confusion abounds, what do we do? We say, well, God ain't the author of confusion. This can't be from God. I know that about God. I know that God's not the author of confusion, so this cannot be coming from God. Then we know the source and we can rebuke it. <clears throat> when you feel tempted to no end, we've all been in a situation where we just feel tempted to no end to do things that we know are not right. God said, you go back to God. You say, God didn't. God won't put more temptation on me than I can bear. God's got a way out, and you start looking for that way out. <clears throat> when you feel as though God isn't near anymore, you need to ask yourself, who moved? Because His Word says, He will never leave me nor forsake me. And we can believe that because Titus 1 2 says, God cannot lie. If He cannot lie, and He says He will never leave you and forsake you, guess what? He's never going to leave you or forsake you. So we take these things that we know about God, we apply them to the situation, we bring them to bear on the problem. And then we leave, the last night, we leave the rest with faith in God and ask Him to show it to you. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, we don't always see the big picture. We see what's directly around us. We see, and we don't even see that good sometimes. We see what's working right around us. We see our circle. We see how things are operating in that. God sees this whole planet. 
what is it, 8 billion people on this planet now? God sees all of them. He sees their situation. God's moving amongst them situation. Every one of them moving amongst them. And see, we get caught up in our own little situations. That's all we see. We don't see the big picture. We don't see what God's ultimate plan is. And we won't see the side of it. I don't believe we will see it. A lot of things. There will be a lot of things that's left unanswered until we get there. Sometimes we just have to believe that God is God and He's got it in control. We have to have faith in Him. There's just some things I don't have answers to. I believe. See, I think when we get to heaven, you know, we all talk about, oh, I can't wait to get there and ask Jesus about this. I don't think you're going to have to. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, you will know as you are known. I think when you see, they say Einstein was working on about, he was one of the smartest men of our generation, they say, he was working on less than 5% of his actual brain what they say. Average person working around four, so a lot of folks I know working on a lot less than that. <laughs> Can you imagine when God lights up that other 95% of your brain? When you get there and the rest of it's functioning and you see things the way God actually sees things. See, in these, these infinite, these, these bodies we got now, they couldn't handle all that knowledge. They couldn't handle all that truth. We'd go slap crazy. When we get there and God opens up that knowledge for us, can you imagine when that other 95% of that right there? We're going to know as we're known. How much does, how well are you known by the Lord Jesus? You know him completely. He knows you inside out. He knows that the count of the hair on your head. There's some of us that's easier for him to count than others. But he knows every hair on your head. He knows you completely, and you're going to know completely when you get there. Let's look at God's response to Habakkuk, verses 5 through 11. Verse 5, he says, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. This is what God said. He said, I heard your prayer, Habakkuk. And I answered, you just didn't recognize my answer. You didn't recognize my answer. You know why you didn't recognize my answer, Habakkuk? Because my answer was so different than what you expected. You wouldn't have believed it if somebody would have told you. My answer was so different than what you expected. He says in verse 6, look there. He says, For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth, to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. The Chaldeans and the Babylonians are one and the same. You can interchange the same people. <clears throat> we know how that story goes. The Babylonian, God raised up this generation of Babylonians. He, he brought them, he brought Judah into exile. And he done that to execute judgment on Judah for their sin. So God had raised up this evil for first generation just to come in there and bring judgment on his people. Now, that don't sound like the answer to prayer we want sometimes, does it? Now, God didn't answer that prayer any way he wanted. I've shared this before, huh? You know, sometimes God just don't answer things we, the way we want. I spoke to my mother earlier, right before she died. I believe in anointing with oil. I believe in anointing somebody and praying over them. My mama wanted to be anointed. She wanted to be prayed over. We anointed her. We prayed over her. That was on Saturday night. She passed away early Tuesday morning. I believe God answered that prayer. He just didn't answer it in the way I expected him to answer. Because my mama is not suffering from cancer anymore. My mama is healed. My mama does not have any more pain. She doesn't have any more suffering because I believe God's Word and I believe what God's Word says so I can rest in faith that my mama is not suffering in any of that anymore. Amen? Amen. Amen. He didn't, you know, I wanted mama to be here with me today. I wanted mama to get to, yep, to hear me preach some more. She only got to hear me preach once or twice. You know, I wanted a lot of things, but God had a different plan he answered my prayer. 
He answered a lot of people's prayers. It just weren't the way we expected. Sometimes God answers these prayers and we don't even recognize the answers because it's not what we expect. He raises up this evil nation to bring judgment on the Babylon or on the Jew on Judah. Now this is an evil group. He goes on to describe them more in verse 7 through 11. You look at that description, they're a pretty rough bunch of group. They're worse than the Washington elect. They're worse than that group up there on Capitol Hill. I mean, they're a pretty evil generation. We can, you know, we can take the back of concerns and apply them today. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, when I started studying, when I started reading them back, I'm like, wow, this is so applicable to today. You know, we got all this stuff going on around us. We got all this sin, all this junk, all this debauchery, you know, sexual perversions. You name it, we're involved. And you're thinking, why, Lord, why are you tearing? Why haven't you come back and brought your judgment on this earth? Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? Why is this stuff going on? Why all the evil in this world? Why are these two choices for president that you left us with? You know, I'm going to just be honest about it. I don't know the answer to all these questions. But a couple things I do know. One, it's okay to ask God about it. It's okay to express your concerns with God. It's okay to come to God and be open with Him, be honest. See, I can come to God and be religious. I can come to God and say, Hey, Lord, it's Jonathan, your righteous servant. I'm here again. You know, or I can come to God and be honest. Hey, it's Jonathan, the sinner saved by grace. They really need you, God. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to come to Him. He wants us to be open and honest. He wants you to express your concerns with Him. He wants you to get naked before Him in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. To just lay it all out there. To put it all out there for Him. That's what He wants from us. But we want to go to Him with our religious selves saying, Oh, I got this all figured out, God, but I was told I needed to talk to you anyway. Way we tend to do things. God, I, I got the answer for you, but I'm going to come talk to you about it. I'm here to counsel you, God, not allow you to counsel me. I'm here to counsel you, God, and tell you the way you ought to operate and the way you ought to do it. And y'all been guilty of that? Amen? Amen. I've been guilty of it. God, I'll tell you what, I don't like the way my young has been acting. And God puts on my heart, well, maybe you ain't been parenting just right. Ooh. Ooh, that burns, don't it? God does something like that. Express your concerns with Him. Get better with Him. Be able to talk to Him. God wants you to be open and honest with Him. And another thing that I can tell you, no matter who's president, Jesus is still king. Amen? Amen. I don't care Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, the other guy, and what's his name? Gary Johnson. Gary Johnson. I don't care which one of them gets selected, or that there's another one running. I can't remember his name either. Only three candidates and all 50 ballots. Well, then three candidates. I don't care which one's running. Jesus Christ is still king. I don't care which one wins. Jesus Christ is still king. Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus still got this thing in control. Jesus is working this thing out to his purpose, to his end. We gotta go along. Yes. We gotta live in faith. Amen. We gotta go with it. We might not like it. We might we might just get under God, why in the world? Why did you let this happen? Why'd you let this man? Why'd you let this woman become president? I could have told you a better one, God. I could have put somebody else better up there for you to be president. Jesus has got it under control. Jesus has got this thing under control. We have to live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 4, we walk by faith, not by sight. We may be absent from the Lord. We might not be in His physical presence right now. But it's by faith we see Him. It's by faith we see Him. 
Best acronym that I ever heard was faith. Forsaking all, I trust him. <coughs> Forsaking all. Putting everything else aside. All our wants, all our desires, all our opinions, all that stuff, putting all that aside, I'm going to trust him. Because he's got this thing under control. A lot of preachers going to stand up in the pulpit and tell you who to vote for, what to do, and all that. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you, preach, vote your convictions. And I pray your convictions line up biblically. What I'm going to tell you is whatever the outcome is, Jesus is in control. Whatever the Supreme Court decides, whatever decisions they make, we've heard decisions in the last year or so, a lot of us didn't agree with. Jesus is in control. Does that mean we sit still and we don't do anything? No, God never told us to do that. I've told y'all before, we're not called to be pew warmers. We're called to be active in it. But when things don't turn out the way you want it to turn out, Jesus is still in control. Christianity 101. I preach this and preach this. And I say this because it's such a simple statement. He's God, I'm not. Christianity 101. Such a simple little old statement. Try applying it into your life. With you. One of the hardest things to apply into our life. He's God. I'm not. Mr. Neil comes up and plays with this. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know where God's dealing with you. I know God has dealt with me in the area of faith, trusting in Him. Because I could really get worked up over some of the things I see, some of the things I see around me. I could really get really righteous. I could really get really, you know, I could become one of them holy in time. You go into hell. You know, I could really get like that sometimes. But I have to sit back and say, God, be control. He's got me. I've got to have faith in Him. I've got to do what He's called me to do, and I've got to leave the results up to Him. I'll make my vote. I'll voice my opinion. But I've got to leave the results up to Him and have faith in Him. I don't know what God's doing with you today, but if He's, whatever it might be, first, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, very first thing, if you don't have a personal intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to be at this altar today. Love to introduce you to Jesus. Love introducing people to Jesus. Whatever the situation might be, maybe it is a lack of faith. Maybe things just seem overwhelming to you, the things going on today. <clears throat> Whatever it might be, if you need to come forward, come forward.